in the, the next hour and a half is show you basically a number of ways in which people are starting to look at synthesizing uh, and organizing materials at the nanoscale that are reactive. Uh, and then, then I'd like to show you some, basically, some uh, combustion experiments that have been looking at uh, the, the reactivity of these systems and, and how they propagate. So if, if we take a look at uh, basically what's been done in, in, in the field, what, what you'll typically find is that there's been uh, numerous small companies and, and numerous uh, methods that have been approached just to make pure nanoparticles. And, and what you find is that almost any type of uh, metallic or metal oxide particle has been produced uh, and, 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 and made in, in nano form. And, and there was many, many startup companies. Uh, th there's still a significant amount of those companies that have survived, although some of the companies ha have since uh, disappeared and, and, and reorganized. Uh, early on, what you found is that people would basically just take the nano powders by themselves and investigate how they would behave if they simply replaced micron material. And so there's been a lot of evidence of putting these materials in propellants, pyrotechniques, or explosives, and, and looking at their response. And in, in general, these are, if you go through the literature, you'll find you, you have greater reactivity, the material's faster burning, uh, and generally evidence for, for good combustion. And as I mentioned, if one concentrates on, on uh, nano-aluminum as the ingredient that's been mass-produced. Uh, the, 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 much of the initial work was, was done by this exploding wire technique uh, that the Russians started. They referred to it as, as Alex. Uh, it's still produced. Uh, you can get it. Uh, uh, it was being distributed out of Florida, but now you have to get it directly from Russia. And uh, it's got a, it, it does not have a very fine distribution. It's got a rather wide distribution in terms of particle size. But it, it does have uh, some good characteristics. Most of the particles that you, you find uh, being mass produced are greater than 20 nanometers. And hence, you don't see this effect of the excess surface energy contributing too significantly. Uh, I'll, I'll conclude this section with, with looking at some ideas of actually producing nanoclusters. Uh, these are, are basically limited amounts of, of aluminum atoms, maybe from 1 to 100 where one actually has control over the size and, uh, and, and the reactivity by adding or subtracting one atom to the cluster itself. Again, just to show you some of the optical properties, you can see here, this is, this is micron aluminum, uh, th this is nano aluminum. So I was telling you about the, the absorptivity coefficient change, and here, here you're just looking at some SEMs of nanoparticles versus uh, micron particles. Okay, so. One of the first things you'll notice, again, and this is a, a, a disadvantage of nanomaterial, much like the oxide coating, what you'll find is the material ages much quicker, and it's uh, sensitive to humidity and environmental conditions. <coughs> These are experiments that were run under accelerated conditions. So it's not something, I mean, just to see how uh, nanomaterial compared to micron material. Uh, and, and what you're looking at here is time and days, but this was under a, essentially a saturated humidity, so very high humidity. Uh, and, and you can see here the nanomaterial actually uh, reacts. Uh, this relative energy is an indication of how much of the, the aluminum core is being further oxidized as the material just sits in the environment under these extreme conditions. And so, as I said, one of the big goals early on was to start looking at how one could replace the naturally occurring oxide layer with essentially a passivated SAM, a self-assembled mono layer on the surface. And to show you one example of that, I want to show you some work that uh, Jason Jouet has done uh, at one of the, the Navy laboratories. And here his goal was essentially to, as I showed you earlier, uh, make small nanoparticles of aluminum and then cap them without an oxide layer, but with essentially a ligand on, on the surface. And, and he did this through a wet chemistry technique uh, working with uh, methyl pyroliidine uh, allane addict, and he added titanium tetrachloride as a catalyst to make uh, aluminum nanoparticles in solution. And to that, then he added basically a perfluoroalkyl carboxylic acids that would end up passivating the surface here with the idea that he formed uh, basically a carboxylate species at the surface here. And to, to show that is exactly what he did here. What I'm showing in this spectra here 
is this is the spectra of the ligands, the, these ligands themselves in solution. And you can see here the presence of the carbonyl stretch as well as the OH stretch here. And this is now when he added the ligands to essentially the solution with the particles. You can see the carbonyl stretch as well as the OH stretch disappear, forming the carboxylic acid at the surface uh, by decisioning essentially the OH bond here to form the carboxylate. And, and this is the resulting species. And now these compounds have been basically stable in air for, for long periods of time. They're nanoaluminum particles with essentially this uh, fluorocarbon surrounding them. And so I come back. This is essentially forming what I said because here the fluorine is essentially an oxidizer. Okay, so I, I've got my binder, I've got my oxidizer incorporated. And what one finds is about at a temperature of 267, in that order, about 260 degrees centigrade, the bond breaks here at the surface. The, this carboxylic acid starts breaking off and these particles become very reactive. Uh, another example of some work that Chris Bunker has done at uh, Wright-Patterson, and he's actually worked with uh, nano iron particles. And again, he's made these in solution through a sonochemical technique. But his interest in terms of an uh, applied reason was he was actually looking at uh, a jet fuel. And he was just thinking, well, you know, a jet fuel typically has some absorbed oxygen in it. And future gas turbines as, as well as hypersonic vehicles are going to run under higher pressure. And as the fuel gets carried down the fuel line towards the injector, it's going to go super critical, and what becomes very important then is, is partial oxidation or uh, 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 pyrolysis, making carbon deposits. And so what he wanted to make was really a smart material that would actually remove the oxygen from the fuel line at a specific location or temperature within that fuel line. And so what he did was he essentially made nano iron particles through a sonochemical technique, and he passivated the surface without an oxide but with uh, for example, oleic acid here, mm -hmm. and created basically a, a, a cap uh, shell type particle system. And his goal was then that basically have the cap, the oleic acid or the AOT come off at a certain temperature above ambient conditions, and that would leave then an unpassivated iron particle, and that would preferentially then react with any absorbed oxygen in the fuel line at a temperature below where the pyrolysis reactions would be enhanced by the presence of the oxygen, okay? And so we'd essentially have a way of in situ removing any oxygen that got absorbed in the fuel line. And to show that the technique worked, uh, I showed the results of some of, of, some of his ex experiments. Here, here's essentially the, the particle size distribution of the, uh, the iron oxide, or sorry, the iron particles that he formed. So you can see they're about six to seven nanometers. And what I show over here is he, he took basically solutions of hexane. So this is his, his, his simulant fuel. He added the nanoparticles to it, and, and he allowed the, the fuel to be saturated in air so it had absorbed oxygen in it. And he did experiments where then he added pyrene. And pyrene was really an, an indicator whether or not the, there was oxygen present or not because what he would do is basically <coughs> look at, he, he'd excite the pyrene and look at the, the fluorescence lifetime. And if he saw the, the lifetime was very long, that would indicate that there was no oxygen in the, in the hexane itself. And if it was very short, the, the oxygen would act as, as a quenching process and, and shorten the lifetime to a very short time scale. So I show experiments where he, he put the, the different types of materials in the hexane over here and looking at then fluorescence lifetime. And I'll, I don't have it labeled here, but I'll work through a couple uh, cases for you. Uh, the, the, the first case here where he's seeing a very short lifetime what he's got here is just the, he's not put the iron particles in. He's just put the ligands themselves, okay? And now what he does is he, he, he irradiates and fluoresces the, the pyrene. And you see because there's still the absorbed oxygen in it, he gets a very short uh, fluorescence time, down around 20 or 30 uh, nanoseconds. The other ones I'll show you is the, these profiles up here that go across here. Here he's done a case where he's just added uh, unpassivated iron particles. And what you can see is if he does add unpassivated iron particles without the oleic acid, the, very quickly the iron reacts with any absorbed oxygen, removes it, and, and then the, 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 the lifetime of the fluorescence is very long. Okay? Now there's a sequence in here where he sees the data go from here up to here to there. These are for the, essentially the coated particles. So you can see at very low temperatures, 
the, 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 the iron particles are coated, so they don't look like they exist. And as a consequence of that, I still have oxygen in my hexane that's quenching the fluorescence of the pyrene. Okay, but then I get to a, a temperature about 110 degrees C. What happens is I uncap, the oleic acid comes off of the iron particle, so I get an unpassivated iron particle. And now very quickly, that unpassivated particle reacts with any absorbed oxygen. And when I do the fluorescence experiments then at higher temperatures, I see that the oxygen has disappeared and I have a very long fluorescence time. So again, the idea of actually making a controlled particle to actually uh, react under conditions that would be desirable for a particular outcome. Now he here's some work that, uh, that we did at uh, Penn State. Uh, this was the idea, if you remember in the very beginning, I, I showed you some experiments of, of self-assembly of the, the silver and gold particles to, to mimic the crystals of nature. Well, I, I showed you, you know, the, the reactivity of these thermites, okay? And so what we wanted to look at, see if we could actually assemble a composite particle of organized aluminum nanoparticles and nanocopper oxide particles. So we essentially started out with, with uh, nanoaluminum about 40 nanometers, nanocopper oxide about 40 nanometers, and the question was then, could we get these particles to self-assemble into some organized fashion? Now we're, we're working with a little bit of disadvantage relative to the people who worked with a, a, a gold and silver because these particles here are, are perfectly spherical and of a very uh, fine dimension, all about five nanometers. Here you can see the, the particles are a regulator and there is a size distribution. So we're not going to be quite as, as satisfactory. Uh, so what we did then is we essentially functionalized the surface of each of these particles separately. And in the case of uh, the aluminum particles, we used omega functionalized o oleic, ac sorry, yeah, oleic acid where we ended up having a carboxylic acid group attached to the aluminum oxide here. And over here, we used a, an omega functionalized alkane thiol group, so where we have essentially a sulfur attaching to the copper oxide. And you can see the, the fact that it's omega functionalized, we have the, the, each of the tail end of the mo molecules oppositely charged. And so each of these were made in, in separate solutions. And then what we did is we gradually mixed the two together. And what happens then is the tail end of the molecules here neutralize themselves and they start to self-assemble and you eliminate the salt. We, we wash away the salt and what you end up with then, instead of having these 40 nanometer particles, the particles have grown to something on the order of about four micron, okay? And you can actually start to see some structure here that shows some organization. We haven't had time to go in and actually see how well it's mixed, but we do have experimental evidence that if we try to ignite this particle, it actually burns rather quick. If I were to take these particles and functionalize them with these ligands without the charge on the end and just mix them by hand, what you would find is they would not mix or they would not burn, okay? And in fact, that the result was because they were not mixed very well. And so you are seeing organized structure through this self-assembly process. Another example of self-assembly here is, again, instead of working with particles, working with wires. Here's a, a case where uh, Basically, uh, nano uh, copper oxide wires were formed. They were then coated with a polyfluorobinyl pyridine. Uh, these have a, a pair of low, uh, uh, lone electrons that can actually form covalent bonds with uh, nano aluminum. And so what was done after coating the, the rods, uh, basically one had a, a self-assembly of the particles on the surface, again forming a composite material that assembled like this. So I have my copper oxide wire and then the nanoaluminum attaching to the surface. I'll show some of the combustion experiment results later on, but what, what people have done typically then is they take these materials, they may lay them in a tray or put them in a small tube, ignite one end of the tube and look at how fast the uh, reaction front propagates down the material. And you can see here, uh, in this case, if I just mix the nanoparticles, I get a propagation speed of about 500 meters per second, which itself is quite fast because the particles are very small. Uh, but if I, if I actually do this self-assembly process, I'm up around 2,500 meters per second. So I'm getting to situations at speeds that look like gas phase detonations. Okay, here, here's another case. Uh, going back to the abalone shell, uh, here's an experiment uh, where people wanted to make layer coils of reactive materials. And this was done through essentially a magnetron sputter process uh, where basically I have a, a, a carousel here and I'm gonna sputter on the surface, say aluminum, create a thin layer of aluminum, then I'm going to sputter, in this case, an intermetallic, say, nickel uh, 
as an example, and I'll create a, a, a layered material that alternates from uh, aluminum, nickel, aluminum, such that these thicknesses here uh, range from uh, on the order of uh, 25 to, 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 to a few hundred nanometers. And what, what has been created, this work was actually started at Lawrence Livermore, uh, and, and Tim has done the work and continued it at, at John Hopkins. There's actually been a small company. You can actually buy these standing foils now, freestanding foils, and, and they've been being sold for, and I'll show an example later, for looking at ways of soldering or doing in situ welding. Okay, here's an example with actually where uh, a copper oxide aluminum foil was made as well. Another example, th th this is again making uh, intermetallic, and this is using some pattern techniques. Uh, this is some work by Carol Rossi, and what she wanted to do was, and I'll show some examples, this is actually starting to put energetics on chips, okay, at, at the scale of, of, you know, actually being able to look at alternatives for electrochemical batteries, storing the energy in, in the, this energetic material. So what she starts off with then is essentially a silicon wafer and she'll put down a small uh, deposit through some sort of vapor deposition of copper, okay? And, and then what she'll do is anneal the copper uh, through an oxidation process, and, and during this process, she'll create these copper oxide nanowires, uh, and, and they have basically dimensions on the order of about 40 to 80 nanometers or so. And then she'll do a physical vapor deposition process of coating the wires with essentially aluminum. And she ends up then with a composite energetic material which she can put anywhere she wants on a chip depending on masking techniques. And what she finds then is uh, ignition temperatures, you know, on the order of about 500 degrees C, uh, the, the, you know, dimensions of hundreds of nanometers here. And you can see the type of energetics that are stored in the system. Just to show you can do it with other materials, she also did it with first uh, a nickel to make nickel oxide. Instead of getting a nanowire, she's actually got sponge material here. Again, then does a, a physical vapor deposition on the material creates a nanocomposite material, which you can, again, regionally locate on a, in a small area. Uh, a, a slightly different uh, ignition temperature here, and the energetics slightly lower. But again, the idea of actually building materials uh, from the bottom up. Uh, here's some techniques that have been developed at Lawrence Livermore for energetic materials, and I, I won't, I'll just give you a, a quick idea. It's basically doing a, a, a sole gel process. So basically creating a colloid, a sole, and this is done in, a, again, a liquid phase where I put a precursor in, I, I make nanoparticles, uh, and, and then I, I allow the, the nanoparticles to, to further cross-link. They end up gelling to make a 3D structure, so I, I, I get now more condensed material. And then to finalize the process, I want to extract then the, the remaining liquid, and I can do this under a very rapid technique through supercritical processes or subcritical processes at a much slower rate and depending on how I do that, I'll end up with either an aerogel or an exogel. And that basically, I have a change in porosity and density of the two materials. Now you can imagine, well, these particles I could start out, these could be essentially either metal particles or, or metal oxide particles, or they would even be organic crystals, okay? And I, and I can end up modifying this. One of the advantages is I can make multi, I can make three-dimensional shapes very easily. And what I can do is I can modify this process as I'm making the, the the, the aerogel or exogel, by during this process, I can have crystals, for example, form during the, the gelling process within the nanoparticles. So this could be a, an oxidizer here. These could be fuel particles. Uh, or I could modify the gelling process where I actually perturb it and I add additional powder to the material where maybe the powder is aluminum particles and I was forming, say, a metal oxide particle here and I, I have the gel then self-mend itself, so I'm making uh, a, a thermite-type system. And I can end up then making uh, well, highly dense, organized uh, nanocomposites that are very reactive. Now, show, to show you a sort of a top-down approach to making these materials, this is some work uh, that's been done at NJIT out of Ed Driesen's group. Uh, this is using basically a mechanical bowl milling technique where I actually start out with micron-sized materials and what I do then is I use basically a, a bowl milling process where I basically apply high forces to, to ma maneuver and interact the, the micron particles to start making nano features. And what I end up with then are, are basically nano composites. So if, if one of these was, uh, say, again, aluminum and nickel or, say, aluminum and a copper oxide here, uh, 
I could end up making nanocomposites would have, which would have these, these uh, nano features, even though the particles themselves are, again, micron size. But they would have the nano features with inside them, potentially make them very reactive. So here you can see some cross sections uh, uh, looking at the, the, the different elements uh, for, a, 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 again, a thermite reaction here. And th this is the starting material. You can see the, the, the micron difference. And if you go through this arrested uh, milling process, you can get uh, basically nano features now and very well mixed particles that are very reactive. And the end result is that they're micron particles, but they have nano features, so the reactivity is totally different than a, than a micron particle. Obviously, one of the problems with this and, and why this is referred to as arrested reactive milling, as I go through this uh, ball milling process, I'm applying very high forces here, and the material can get hot itself. And what I have to be careful is I don't get near the ignition temperature of where the intermetallic or the, the uh, thermite reaction will actually occur. So I actually have to arrest and stop the milling process before I get to that temperature. Uh, another example, and, and we're doing some of this work at, at Penn State, is, uh, is we'd like to build bulk material. And, and this is by using basically a high velocity particle uh, consolidation method or a cold spray method. And what we do here is again, uh, we, we take particles and we accelerate them to very high velocities through essentially a converging, diverging, say, de Laval nozzle. So I add a lot of kinetic energy to the flow of the particles, and then I just impact them on a substrate. And the advantage is here, because of the, the high kinetic energy, when they impact here, the temperature remains below the melting temperature of the material. So I can actually start forming composite material uh, uh, with, without having it, it react at a very cold temperature. And you can build up then very thick materials of different shapes and, and, and essentially build bars of material here that are very reactive. And, and just to give you an indication that indeed it is reactive, uh, what I show here is essentially a, a bar that was made of nickel and aluminum. And this is uh, of the dimensions of a centimeter. And you can, you can see that the reaction proceeded to it uh, rather quickly. Now, now again, the idea is of how can these materials be used? Uh, an example, and, and along with the foils, is in situ welding. Suppose I need to do under, under, under seawater welding, for example. I could put the materials, th this sort of, I could coat materials like this on either side of the specimens that needed to be welded, then uh, apply a pressure to hold them together, and then I can send a reaction wave through them where the temperature can get up to as high as a few thousand Kelvin to basically create a weld. Uh, from a military point of view, uh, th there's other interests in, in sort of these materials. Uh, one of the interests there is if I look at basically energetics, I go back to that energetic slide that I showed you earlier, and I compare TNT to basically intermetallics and, and the thermites. What you realize is if I'm dealing with organic material, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, I can only store so much energy in those chemical bonds. And so if I have a munition, a question is asked, well, how can I put more energy into that munition? One way to do it is make the casing reactive itself. So essentially, make the casing out of a reactive material like this. OK, so I want to give some other examples of other materials that are being made. And a good example is instead of using aluminum, it is essentially looking at silicon reactives. And you might ask, well, why silicon? And there are some interesting reasons. As I, if you go back to the early thermodynamics, if you remember, I, I said that aluminum would burn in the vapor phase if it was a macroscopic particle. Silicon would always burn heterogeneously. So just like boron, if I'm working with macroscopic particles, you might say, well, the, because of uh, reaction at a surface being kinetically controlled potentially, I, 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 there may not be advantages to trying to react something in a, at a heterogeneously in a vapor phase process would be to their advantage. But the problem is if I shrink aluminum particle down to the dimensions, I've also got a heterogeneous process itself. So I lose that advantage of aluminum. But there's other advantages of silicon itself. And, and in fact, the, the naturally occurring oxide layer on silicon is thinner. It's not as permeable, so it doesn't oxidize as fast as I showed you earlier. Uh, it's, it would be less sensitive. Uh, because there's a lot of technology that's been in the, the MEMS community, I could actually integrate this material directly in MEMS devices. So if I want to start making microthrusters, I want to start using this energetic material for actuation, I've got one of the components, the fuel, already in my microelectronic device. Uh, I recognize from the semiconductor industry there's a lot of ways that people tune 
the, 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 the resistivity and the flow of electrons. Can I actually do that with controlling reactions in silicon material by changing the amount of doping in the system, applying electric fields to, to turn the reaction on and off by changing the flow of electrons? Uh, there's also the, the possibility of looking at silicon in terms of nanomaterial from two different points, working with nanopowders, as I've been showing you for, for example, the aluminum, or actually looking at nanopore silicon, which is well known in the electronics field for looking at optical properties uh, of silicon by, by taking wafers and, and making pores, by etching pores in the material itself. Now, one of the other interesting features is that the surface chemistry is much better studied for silicon than it is for aluminum and other metals. And this comes out of, again, the microelectronics field. And during the etching process, if I use something like hydrofluoric acid to etch it, what I do is I remove the silicon dioxide and I can terminate the surface with hydrogen atoms. So I don't have any oxygen around any oxide remaining. And there's a lot of chemistry one can use in terms of hydrosylation type reactions where I can, again, substitute the hydrogen atom on the surface itself with functional groups that are, say, fluorocarbons or other sorts of hydrocarbon ligands. And, and this sort of chemistry here is, is quite well known. So he, here's an example of the, the process in which one would make, for example, nanopore silk. And you can do this with powders or you can do it with wafers. One typically uses a, an electrochemical etching process. <coughs> I'll start off with, say, a, a silicon wafer. I'll create a bath that includes uh, hydrofluoric acid uh, that's probably dissolved in, in some solvent like ethanol. And then I put a potential across this. And what I do then is I allow the fluorine to react with essentially the silicon to create pores uh, and remove silicon. And, and the way it reacts then depends on the, the type of doping originally in the material here. So you can see as these pores are being created, I can get structures that are, are essentially uh, mostly one directional versus becoming very branched and chained. And this depends on how it's doped, if it's either N-doped or, or P-doped, uh, et cetera. Then what I end up with then is a structure that looks like this. So I'm looking at a side view of a, of a wafer here. And th this is the substrate. And what you're seeing down is a cross cut. These are the pores that can be etched at different depths. And what people have done to make these materials energetic then is they essentially fill the pores then with different sorts of oxidizers. The type of oxidizers people have looked at are perchlorates, nitrates, sulfur. And, and there's different procedures in which one does that. One does a drop cast where Essentially, one puts the oxidizer in a solvent, just allows it to, to flow into it, and then removes the solvent. And what remains behind is the oxidizer and the pores. Uh, one can do melt casting, where one, for example, melts sulfur on the surface, or using different pressure conditions, for example, super critical pressure conditions to, to re remove the surface tension and do it under uh, a high pressure condition. OK, so another material that people are working with is, is carbon, as I mentioned. Uh, carbon nanotubes has been looked at, and I'll show some uh, examples of what, how people are starting to think about carbon nanotubes. But here I show essentially the idea of looking at graphene sheets. Uh, one of the important areas in terms of reactivity is the available surface area. And if I look at a, a, a graphene sheet, essentially what it is is a carbon, a single walled carbon nanotube that's been sliced and opened up to, to make essentially a, a, a single sheet. And, and, and as a consequence of that, I have a thickness here that's one atom thick that's less than a nanometer. And the XY dimensions are on the order of a micron. So one has very large potential surface areas that one can work with with regards to reactivity or actually using the graphene itself as a transporter of other materials. So depending on how it's functionalized, having organic material on the surface or actually pinning to the surface and decorating it with, with nanometal particles that can be placed there without sintering. Uh, the way the, the one way in which the sheets are made is to start off with, with graphite, uh, impregnate it with, with oxygen to make graphite oxide. And this typically has uh, a carbon to oxygen ratio of two. And then what I can do is thermally exfoliate, so basically heat the material quickly, have the, the, the oxygen bonds here separate. And what I do then is I create sheets. And as this separates and breaks apart, I get functional groups remaining on the surface that can look like epoxides, hydroxides, so they could have different levels of oxygen. And as it breaks apart, it also create, creates defect sites that could be used potentially uh, for reactivity. Okay. And so that one of the questions is, how can this material be used? Well, as I said, it could be used as a substrate itself for carrying other material. And here's a case, again, uh, Ilhan Oxide. This is some of his work uh, with PNNL at Princeton here in the chemical engineering department. Uh, 
where he's actually uh, put platinum on the surface, for example, making a, a nanocatalyst type system. Uh, and he's done this first by putting down uh, idium tin oxide at the defect sites and then attaching platinum to the ITO in a way that would prevent it from sintering during this process. And you can see here some SEMs, TMs of, of essentially the, the aluminum being uh, attached to the uh, uh, idium tin oxide and then the, and the graphite sheet. Now, here's another example, and th this has only been studied so far uh, through molecular dynamics calculations. Uh, but again, it's, a, it's the imagination and the thought process that people are starting to look at here. And there's been some preliminary work on this uh, at, at the Army laboratories. And, and really, the question is, can I actually come up with a way using either carbon nanotubes or, or graphene sheets to stabilize polymeric nitrogen? But polymeric nitrogen is, is just chains uh, of nitrogen atoms, okay? So I might have something that's doubly bonded and then singly bonded. And what you can see here, obviously, the, if I look at single bonds and, and compare it to what's the, the stable state of, uh, of uh, molecular nitrogen, if I have a polymer like this decomposed to, to make triple bonds, I'm going to get a significant amount of heat release. These materials are highly energetic, okay? And, and so far, the only way in which one can stabilize polymeric nitrogen is under extremely high pressure conditions where the, the material is confined in like a cage, okay? But the, the idea here then is to essentially use the carbon nanotube structure itself as a cage and internally then stabilize polymeric nitrogen. And again, what I would be doing is creating then a highly energetic material that would exceed basically much of those organic crystals that are energetic materials now. And, and this shows some results of, of some uh, MD and, 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 and QM calculations that have been shown that really show that one can indeed stabilize uh, polymer nitrogen inside and between sheets of, of graphene. Okay, uh, another process, another top-down process in which people are making nanomaterial is through high-pressure supercritical processing uh, of, uh, uh, and making material. And again, this, this is much starting out with the original material and getting it to, to, to uh, uh, make single molecules and have those single molecules then nucleate. So I start off with some sort of supercritical fluid and I add my solute. Uh, this has been used typically for organic material. So uh, there's been studies looking at different types of oxidizers. I show here an example of using RDX, which is a, a, a high explosive. And what one does then, for example, using a supercritical fluid like carbon dioxide, one can dissolve the RDX in, in the, the, the supercritical fluid, then one quickly, rapidly expands it. And during the expansion process, I, I look at the homogeneous nucleation, and I try to control that process to, to make certain size of RDX particles, okay? And then I try to capture them, okay? The, the, the issues with these sort of processes is how much solute can I actually dissolve in the supercritical fluid itself. So you need to find a supercritical fluid in which I can load it pretty high to make this overall efficient. The second issue is how do I actually collect the particles? Obviously, if, I, if I'm expanding it and using something like CO2 as my uh, supercritical fluid, during the expansion process, I actually create dry ice and I, I actually store the particles and can quench them and, and size them by how fast the dry ice is formed. Other techniques have been to replace the, and, and ex essentially expand the, 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 the gas and the, the supercritical fluid and essentially a liquid and as that process occurs create a, a colloid and use the, the colloids that are formed in liquid to actually cap the particles and, and, and quench their size. And so I, I show some examples here where RDX particles are being formed. You can see some examples uh, of, of particle size distributions. Uh, and, and in general what people have found in terms of sensitivity tests, the particles themselves become less sensitive. And what's really, I think, you know, looking down the road, as I mentioned, is the idea of actually making clusters, okay? And, 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 and by making clusters, this is actually, again, th uh, through a gas phase process, starting to assemble atoms up, uh, one atom almost at a time, and, and creating very small particles that are on the size of a, a, a nanometer or a few nanometers, where I have control sizes. And I show here an example of some work that was done in Germany where uh, basically through a metal halide uh, reactor, 
what one created was essentially aluminum 77 clusters. And these have actually been stabilized during the process through capping the outer shell here with these ligands here. And you can see that the, the structure of what this looks like is starting with a, a, a core shell containing 13 aluminum atoms, then a, a, an inner between shell with 44, and then an outer shell with 20 aluminum atoms. And some of the work that's been done uh, at different locations, I, I pick out one group at Penn State, Will Castleman, has been working in cluster area for a number of years. And he's actually been looking at some of the chemistry issues of, of clusters. And, and what he's actually been able to demonstrate is, as he builds clusters up, and these could be ionic clusters, as he builds the clusters up one atom at a time, the reactivity changes significantly as he adds one atom of aluminum or as he takes it away. For example, if he, he builds an aluminum 13 ion cluster, it's totally unreactive with regards to oxygen. But if he adds or subtracts one atom from that, it becomes very reactive. So the idea of actually controlling reaction. We're, get, we're beginning a project right now with, with uh, Brian Eckhorn, who also has a metal halide reactor, where we're going to start making clusters, these aluminum 77 clusters, and dispersing them initially in liquids. But the idea will be then to eventually uh, let them grow to 77, cap them, and then form aggregates up to the micron scale and to start looking at how we can look at these structures with a, at the micron scale that would have these nano features with the idea that they're going to explode apart as they start reacting. Okay, so I, I, I've shown you some different ways in actually assembling these materials. Let me, let me give you an idea of uh, impacts of how they, they might react. Uh, as I mentioned before, one of the first ways people started looking at the reactivity of these materials was just to replace micron materials with nanomaterials, okay? And, and obviously, the, one of the early areas in which this was done was in propellants. Uh, another area that was in the, the pyrotechnics community, uh, and this might be related also to the, the SHS processing that I told you where people worked with thermite-type reactions or intermetallics. And so what I'm going to show here are some examples of, of intermetallics. If I, if I work at the micron scale and I do an SHS reaction, the propagation speed's probably on the order of maybe centimeters per second, okay, or, or even millimeters per second. So it's a relatively slow process, okay. And now I'm going to take that length scale from, say, the micron particle down to the nanometer scale. And the way people have done this then is they've taken nanometer particles uh, and they, they typically put them in a solution. Uh, sonicated them to get a well mixing dispersion. And I showed an example here of dispersing aluminum with copper oxide. Then they'll take the, they'll dry out the hexane, and then they might fill a tube like I show here with the, the nano powder. It could be, uh, have different types of densities in here. They could be loosely packed, they could be packed to high density. And they'll ignite it at one end, and they'll look at the propagation speed as the reaction propagates through the material. And the, the, potentially they could locate pressure transducers along here. Or, or, or photodiodes to get the luminosity from the reaction to track how fast it goes. Okay, so what I show here are some examples of those results in an experiment like this. And you'll see it's very familiar to a gas phase type reaction. So what I'm plotting here is essentially equivalence ratio for a, a mixture of nano aluminum and nano moly trioxide. So this is a thermite reaction. And what I'm doing here is I'm changing in the mixture the mass weight of nano aluminum. So I'm going from fuel lean to fuel rich. And what you can see here then is the propagation speed that's been measured through these tubes. The tubes typically have a dimension of about an eighth of an inch to a quarter inch internal diameter. And you can see here the propagation speeds. The, first of all, there's a lean flammability limit as I go towards stoichiometric conditions. The propagation speed increases. I'm actually getting speeds on the order of 1,000 meters per second. So just by changing the length scale, as I said, from the micron scale to the, down to the nanometer scale, this was probably done with, with particles on the order of about 80 nanometers. Uh, I've changed the speed from centimeters up to meters, uh, close to 1,000 meters per second. As I go further fuel rich, I see a situation where the type of reaction that occurs changes drastically. It might go through this sort of accelerating front. So when it starts off in the tube, it's slow, and then it accelerates. You can actually see instabilities where the reaction might spiral. And then I come down to another stable steady state solution where the reaction front I is much slower, okay? And, and again, I eventually get to a rich flammability. So again, the idea of, you know, looking at reaction rates as a function of, of mixture ratio, uh, you see characteristic like this. And then you see these sort of characteristics with micron particles too, but nowhere as near as fast. Uh, 
if I were to do a back of the hand calculation of what the sound speed is in this multi-phase mixture with voids, what I would find is the sound speed's about 300 meters per second. So based on that, you would say these waves are traveling at supersonic conditions. Because of the high speeds here, you can also look, suppose I change the dimensions of the channel, right? One thinks of gas phase reactions and a quenching diameter, okay? If you look here, the, this is effectively a, the diameter of the tubes in which have been studied. And actually, there's, there's been studies now even to smaller uh, diameter tubes. And this is the propagation velocity. You can see, obviously, a, as the tube gets smaller, the propagation velocity starts falling off. But I can still propagate reactions down to about tens of microns. So channels that are tens of microns thick, I'm still propagating in the meters per second. So these reactions are extremely fast, okay? And they're so fast at that scale, they, they have little time to lose heat to the surroundings. I mean, obviously, you can see some quenching effect here. So what I want to do, I'll show you a couple of movies here because I want to point out a couple points. I'll show you a movie here propagating at uh, a loading of 38%, then 70%, and then in this region over here. Now, I'm not sure. So that, that's, this is a high-speed camera, and that was going up just about 1,000 meters per second, okay? Now, you, you can't see it, but which way, if I have a supersonic wave, which way should the gas flow behind the wave? It's, it's, what, okay, if I have a deflagration, which way is the gas flow behind the deflagration, a, 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 a subsonic wave? It flows in the opposite direction as the wave's going. If I have a supersonic wave, the material flows in the same direction. Okay? If you look at this quick and it's so bright you really can't see it, you'll see it a little bit better in the next case, but the material is indeed flowing in the same direction as the wave. Okay, come over here, this is the case with 70%, and you'll see now, you can see the material on the left-hand side going in the same direction as the wave. This is the case where it was a, that accelerating front. So when it started off, it was subsonic, and then it starts to accelerate to a much faster speed. Okay, the last case I'm showing you is in, is in the, that slow regime, and it may be faint to see, but because it, it's moving so slowly, this was taken with a high-speed camera, but the material, if you can see it, you probably can't, is going the opposite way in which the wave is moving very slowly. Because this is now, again, this was 1,000 meters per second. This was down to the centimeters per second. So I've gone from a subsonic system to what appears to be a supersonic system in this multi-phase mixture. Okay, here's some other results from these systems that one can look at and compare to, to micron material. What I find is if I change the packing density, okay, for a nanothermite system, if I increase the packing density so I'm getting rid of the voids, the propagation speed decreases, okay? And we'll see that that's important because of the, the presence of the void determines how the propagation mechanism occurs. If I'm working with a, a micron type material and I compact it, these are actually pellets here I'm looking at. These aren't loose powders. They have different densities of pellets. As I pack it even more for a micron material, the speed actually goes up, okay? And what you're going to see here is that for the micron material here, what I'm doing is I'm essentially having a conductive wave, much like a premixed gaseous flame. I'm having a conductive wave travel down the material. In the material that's at the nanoscale, where I potentially have some more voids in the system, I'm actually transitioning from a convective wave to a conductive wave. I'll come back to this. You can also see the effects of uh, ignition on the size of the particle here, uh, which was shown again for, th these are in thermite mixtures, but it resembles looking at the single particles. As I decrease the size of the particle, the basically ignition delay time uh, decreases. So I'm effectively lowering the ignition temperature or energy as well. Okay, so just to give you some idea of what are these sort of propagation mechanisms uh, and why this extreme of, of so slow speeds versus so high speeds. Well, w what I basically have here, depending on how the material is packed, I can actually have what's referred to as a convective wave or a conductive wave. In this particular case, it's essentially like a, a premixed gaseous flame. I have a, a reaction zone, the high temperature creates a temperature gradient, and from that temperature gradient, I have a conductive wave transporting the energy upstream to ignite and bring the material up to sort of a, a high reaction rate to accelerate it. In the case of a convective wave, what I have is essentially a very fast reaction rate locally that locally creates a significant amount of gas. 
So whereas I might treat this as a constant pressure process across the reaction front, in this case, the reaction front is so fast that it appears to be more like locally a constant volume process. So I get basically a pulse of pressure. Okay, and because I'm creating a pressure gradient then between here and what's upstream, I have basically a convective wave that's passing energy forward, preheating it, and I get a much faster propagation mode. Okay, and obviously then this wave here depends on how fast I can make gas locally. Now, to show you that indeed those sort of things are happening, here's some examples where the same sort of tube experiments were conducted, but they were put in that tube, and the tube itself was put in a pressure chamber. Okay, so what I'm showing here then is propagation velocities. This is now for an aluminum copper oxide nanothermite. And again, at atmospheric pressure, I'm getting propagation velocities about 1,000 meters per second. As I increase the pressure around that tube, and essentially the interstitial void pressure is going up as well, you can see the mode of propagation changes. First it goes through an accelerating, then an oscillating front, and then I've dropped the propagation speed down to be in a very low meters per second. So I've dropped the speed by about a factor of 10 to the third or so, 10 squared. Okay, and this happens also with, if I use, I switch this, this pressurizing gas from argon or helium, you see some elimination of the transition because of the change in thermal properties here. But in, in fact, if you were to measure the overshoot in pressure, what you see, and that's what this is, here you're measuring the overshoot and pressure on the right-hand side here uh, for the one case. You see at the low pressures at the reaction front, I get a very huge overpressurization at the reaction front. As I increase the pressure, the overpressurization is very small so that I'm not getting that convective wave creating that very fast reaction front. And this obviously is happening for a number of regions. As I pressurize the system, I'm putting more inert material in the void space, which I have to heat up, so I'm lowering the flame temperature. The other thing I'm doing as I'm increasing the pressure, I'm changing the conditions under which I have phase transformations, and I end up with more solid material versus gaseous material. So two things, I've lowered the temperature, uh, and I've lowered the amount of gas that can form, and as a consequence of that, I've changed from a conductive wave to a convective wave. Now, if you do measurements, uh, say through some sort of pyrometry measurements on the temperature of these waves, what you'll typically find is, for example, in the case of aluminum copper oxide in these small channels, you'll find temperatures up around 2350, a little over 2000 Kelvin uh, for moly trioxide. And if I look at something like iron oxide as my oxidizer, the temperature starts to fall off. If you look over here, I, what I've plotted here is essentially the, the melting points or the vaporization temperatures, the boiling points of the components that are involved. And what this would suggest at these temperatures here, all the final products are in the condensed state. So you might ask, well, where's all the gas coming from that drives these systems in that convective wave? Okay, because the final states of those experiments have temperatures that are well below the boiling points to form any gas. And you can do a number of experiments, but what you typically will find is in these systems to get these fast propagation rates, what it looks like partly is it's the role of the oxidizer, that uh, the metal oxide is placing in terms of forming gas. And to, to illustrate that, what I show here then is some properties on the different oxides that were shown on the previous case. And what you find here then is, for example, copper oxide, which was one of the cases that had a very fast reaction front, uh, had basically a decomposition temperature of about 1400 Kelvin. Iron oxide, which actually propagates very slow, has a, a decomposition temperature of about 1750 Kelvin, and the moly trioxide, which had a very fast propagation front, actually has a boiling point about 1400 Kelvin. So if I go back to the previous view graph, you can see the first two cases here had temperatures that exceeded the decomposition temperatures of the oxidizer, whereas the slow propagation for the iron oxide, you can see the change in rates, a kilometer per second versus 0.1 meters per second. This had a, a decomposition temperature that exceeded the flame temperature. Okay, suggesting that the role of the oxidizer is playing a very important role in generating and igniting these particles initially, creating, for example, suboxides or, or oxygen atoms or molecular oxygen that's actually being transported and reacted with the, the fuel. The, the, to show you that a little bit further, then you might ask, well, maybe the size of the oxide particles is actually more important than the size of the fuel particles. And to illustrate that here, 
just some combinations of, of changing the size of the oxide particles versus the fuel particles. So combinations of micron, micron, or nano, nano for both the fuel and the oxidizer. We're having one situation where the, the fuel is of the micron size and the oxidizer is of nano and vice versa. What you find here in, in terms of the ball chart, if you have nano, nano, that has the highest propagation speed. But the next highest propagation speed is when I have the nano oxidizer versus the, the uh, aluminum. The aluminum can still stay at the micron scale. And what seems to be most important in this particular system is to have the oxidizer because it's what's forming the gas very quickly. So I need that added surface area. And the, the characteristic length over which that, that gas has to be formed the si it depends very much on the size of the particle. And if I go down to basically micron, micron, or, or micron, uh, copper oxide nano aluminum, you can see that the, the speeds are actually lower. And this is also consistent then with the, the gas overshoot. You find in these two cases here, the overpressurization is very small. And these two cases here, I get a significant overpressurization due to the nano copper oxide in the system. Okay, let me show you some experiments with, with reactions in uh, some of the silicon material. Uh, just a little bit of historical perspective. Uh, you can actually see silicon has been used in, in energetic materials for quite some time, typically more so in the pyrotechnics community than, say, for example, the propellants uh, community. Uh, the, the very first fast re reaction of nanoporous uh, silicon was actually uh, found by McCord, where he accidentally put some nitric acid on, on porous, uh, nanoporous silicon, and he actually got a, a, a very fast reaction resulting. Uh, in, in 2002, there was work actually where, uh, again, uh, a, a sort of thermite reaction was shown to, uh, to be very fast, a solid state explosive reaction using porous silicon. And most recently, Comlent in, in Germany has looked at many different oxidizers with porous silicon and actually has produced igniter systems for airbags using porous silicon and, 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 and these nanoporous energetic materials. Examples of the pore fillers, as I said before, could be for chlorates, nitrates, sulfur, uh, anything that you can get that could be held and stabilized within the pores, and that's not too hygroscopic. Some of these materials here are very hygroscopic, and you'd actually, over a length of period of time, you'd actually have to keep them covered. Okay, so here, here's an example uh, of some work with, with uh, nanopores, uh, silicon, in which sodium perchlorate was added as the oxidizer. And what this, you can see here, this was a silicon wafer there was basically a channel uh, that was masked off, uh, and this was etched. Uh, in this case, it was a galvanetric, but galvanetric uh, etching process, but one could have used the uh, hydrofluoric acid as well. And so in this region here, you have the, the, the porous silicon. This was filled then with sodium perchlorate. You can see uh, basically MEMS fabrication processing was used to put down an igniter wire across the porous silicon. And these are basically break wires that as the reaction after it gets ignited here will essentially break the wires and you can measure then the propagation speed. And in doing this, they measure propagation speeds on the order of about two to 3,000 meters per second. So these reaction fronts are very fast during the propagation. Now, we've done some work in this area as well. And again, I want to show you here this example of this multi-structural scale. And whereas this group here worked with low p-doped material. And p-dope material means I'm, I'm basically doping the material with basically a group three uh, material. So what it does is it creates electron holes. There's a basically an electron hole missing in, 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 the, in the structure itself. And they, these were low doped uh, systems and they got these very fast propagation rates. We've done the same thing, but we were using very high doped uh, material, p-dope material. And you can see here, here's some cross sections of the, of the etching process. And here you can see the nanopores, uh, 20 nanometers or so. They're quite regulated. And you can see the depth of the pores. In our particular experiments, we were actually filling the pores here with magnesium perchlorate. And we'd measure, very similar in, in the other uh, example, we'd measure the propagation speed. In this case, we were using a high-speed camera. Now, when we did this, we varied equivalence ratios by changing how much mass of oxidizer we added to the pores. And, and because the pores were well-defined and stable, we could actually do a gravimetric analysis on getting the equivalence ratio. But what we could never do is we could never get the high propagation speeds. And in fact, you can see no matter what we do with equivalence ratio here, we're getting propagation speeds about three meters per second versus the 3,000. Okay, and so we got very curious 
why we were getting such low propagation speeds. And so if you go back and look at the structure, we decided to take a closer look at what the other group was using. And they were using low peak doped material. And when you look at this cross section, it looks very similar to our material. But when you start zooming in on the top, what you start to observe is another structure in the system of this low dope material when it's etched. And what you see is there's actually small cracks. And potentially, there's still some nanopores here. Okay, but these features are now more at the micron scale. And you can see a side view here. You're actually creating these pillars. And as I said, this could have nano structure in it. And now we have micron structure. And we started to ask ourselves whether or not could it be this hierarchical structure that's leading to these very high propagation speeds. So we decided to make these materials ourselves, but with the very high dope material versus the low dope material, which did not naturally form the cracks. So we had to artificially make the cracks. And we did this basically through a lithography technique. So we basically have masked off certain portions of the silicon wafer such that we would actually create using a, a reactive ion etch first. We'd actually make pillars of micron scale. So th these are essentially pillars. Uh, and we essentially then remove the, the mask. Uh, and then we would etch it using the same wet etch to get each of the pillars having a nanopore structure. OK, so now we have two scales here. We have the nanoscale structure as well as the, the micron structure. And the question is, would this new structure yield the very high propagation rates that was seen in the low dope material? And to illustrate that, what we did is we created materials like this. So here's, a, a, again, a, looking at a top view of a piece of the, the silicon wafer. This is the, just the, the high dope material doped or, or etched to create the nanopores. And on the second half of the material here, we put this organized structure with the micron features as well as the nano features. And what I'm going to show you then here is flipping this on the side, looking at a side view. And you can start to see what's happening here from the pictures. Initially, it's the propagation is going to start. And I'm going to get a steady propagation front. Don't, these times are probably off here. They're not linear. Uh, but what you'll see here is a steady wave about three meters per second, and then a drastic change when it hits the, the pillars. So again, you're seeing a side view on the, on the right-hand side over here. The waves propagating up through this material right now. Uh, you can see the products flying backwards, side view. And you get a steady reaction front about three meters a second. And again, three meters per second is a very fast reaction, uh, thinking that most hydrocarbon flames propagate centimeters per second. Then you get to this point here, and the reaction front changed. It actually increased by orders of magnitude. Okay? And so what we're seeing here is this multi kale structure actually changing the, the mode of propagation. And so what we believe, again, we're seeing here, in this region here, we're probably seeing a simple conduction wave uh, in which the, the rate of reaction is dependent on about the, the, the local surface area. And then as I, I move up into this region here, I'm changing the mode of propagation. The local reaction rate's not changing, but the way I'm transporting the material forward is. And I'm probably turning it into a convective wave. And so it's actually accelerating quite quickly. OK, uh, this is one of the, the last few examples I'll show. This is a case of asking whether or not doping. You know, again, I, you know, the question is, can we start making these materials smart? Can we control their reaction rates? Can we turn them on? Can we turn them off? And I know, you know in, in working with these sort of reactions where I'm looking at a metal, metal oxide, I'm essentially working with an oxidation reduction reaction, which really requires the transfer of electrons. OK? And this is the same thing that happens in an MP semiconductor, OK? And so what I'm going to have here is essentially a reducing agent, which is going to be the electron donor. And I'm going to have an oxidizer, which is going to be the electron acceptor, OK? And I can look at this then in the idea that if I have an n-type material, it can be treated as essentially a reducing agent. Because if I have an n-type material, like say the doping material is arsenic, what I'm doing is when I add that material, I'm actually adding one excess electron to the the, the, the bulk material here. Whereas if I'm adding uh, essentially a p-type material, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an electron hole. So it's going to be missing an electron. Okay? And as a consequence of that, this, this n-type material will be able to provide the electron and be the reducing agent, whereas the, the p-type would be the, the acceptor. And so there's been some work looking at very slow solid state reactions, germanium and molytrioxide where uh, Schwab here has actually gone in and changed the doping of germanium. Okay? And so the idea here 
is if I turn this into an n-type -tope, n germanium where I have this extra electron, and since it's the reducing agent, what I'm going, I should end up getting a faster reaction. And indeed, that's exactly what's shown. And, and if you were to change this to a p-type, it actually slows the reaction down. Now, these reactions are solid state reactions, and they, they occur over you know, a very long period of time. And one of the questions was, can the same sort of process happen in these very fast reactions? And effectively, what, what initially what was th being thought what was done here is as you change the characteristics in the doping of the material, what you're doing is you're changing the initial energy state of the reactants, so you're changing the effective activation energy of the reaction. And so uh, this is some work that Steve Sun has done at Purdue here. And what you see here is that he, he, he wanted to see whether or not he could do this under these fast reactions using silicon nanopowders as the fuel. And he then take an oxidizer. In this case, he'll, he'll actually use Teflon as the oxidizer. So he'll be looking at a fluorinated reaction. But to get very accurate doping levels, what he actually took was very precise silicon wafers and ball milled them to make particles. Okay, and, and the type of doping materials he looked at, he, he basically looked at intrinsic silicon. He looked at a low p-type doping uh, with boron and n-doped uh, with arsenic and then a high p-type uh, uh, material with, with boron. And he, he ball mill them down, create particles, and he went through and he sized the particles, made sure the particles had the same sort of surface area so he wasn't artificially changing the surface area as he ball milled them. He also looked at the morphology of the particles, made sure that the surface characteristics all had the same sort of fracture type features. And he concluded at the very end that the material he made at, uh, after ball milling it was all similar. And the only thing that should have changed then was the, the characteristics of the, the doping concentration or the doping material itself. And then what he did is he took the material and he made pellets out of it uh, with essentially compressing it into pellets with essentially Teflon. And when he did it, here's the propagation speed results he saw. He very much indeed saw an effect of doping on the material. But what you see here is this is the intrinsic values. And it didn't really matter what type of dopant material he used. But it's, it was dependent more on the concentration of the dopant versus the type. And so now the question is, well, well what's really doing this? Because the previous theories didn't seem to indicate this was the situation. So he comes down and he also does some thermogravimetric analysis where he does an isokinetic analysis on the results to back out an overall activation energy. And he finds the same sort of conclusions that I showed in the previous view graph, that as he adds dopant material, the effective activation energy is dropping. Okay, again, consistent with the results here in these propagation measurements indicating that it should actually propagate at higher speeds. So some of the questions was, well, well is it just because he's adding boron or this other material to the material that's actually making it faster? So he the first thing he did was he artificially added just some boron nanoparticles to the material. And he found that when he added these separately, he saw no change in the, in the propagation speed. So whatever was causing it was the fact that it was intrinsic within the silicon material itself. And so one thing he did, he also measured the resistivity of the materials. And he actually finds that independent of the dopant type, as he added dopant material, the electron mobility or the resistivity of the material changed. So that maybe is one plausible explanation. <coughs> Another explanation, and, and this one may be one of the more likely ones, is that as he was adding the dopant, any dopant that I add is I, I can change the strain energy in the lattice structure because the size of the material is different. So if I add a material that's a larger atom in size, I'm actually putting strain in the lattice structure. So I'm adding energy that I'm storing in those bonds. And if you look at, say, the, just the intrinsic value here, if I go either small, high, larger diameter atoms or smaller diameter, I'm going to basically increase the strain energy in this system. And it could be this extra energy I'm adding to the, the, the crystalline structure that's responsible for this increase in reaction rate and effectively lowering the activation energy. Another feature I, I came back and you know, I, I showed you in the very beginning that these particles change their absorptivity properties Okay, as you change the scale. Well, what one finds very readily is because the absorption cross sections are very high, as I shrink the material down, the absorption of photons is very efficient. So I can actually use photons to ignite the material. Okay, and I showed a, a situation here where just a flash from a camera is ex essentially igniting silicon nanowires. Okay, and, and you can do the same thing with carbon nanotubes. If you get single walled carbon nanotubes, you put them on a pile, you can actually find little videos of this on the web, take a picture of it relatively close, it'll burst into a reaction. Okay, the same thing happens with the nanothermite. So now 
you're again starting to look at how I can ignite these nanomaterials in a different way. Suppose I wanted to create a sensor, and I want to put this sensor out in a field, and I want it to stay there for years. I don't want to have to come back to it. And I'm going to want it to wake up all of a sudden, maybe due to a bright flash. Okay? And so on this sensor, I can't use an electrochemical battery because it's not going to last more than you know, a year. But I can store that energy in an energetic material basically for long periods of time. And so if I can wake it up, say, with a flash to focus it, I can create thermal energy and potentially I can create that thermal energy into a burst of electrical power that I could actually power a small sensor to do something with. So these are sort of the ideas that people are thinking about. Again, another example of using uh, these small scale materials, this is some of the, the work looking at uh, direct uh, chemical looping. Again, this involves looking at thermite reactions and again you can ask, well, what's the scale? And, and how can one make use of scale to, to, to have these systems react? One of the, the big questions in this process and what people typically have is two reactors here. I mentioned a little bit of that. And I'm not sure if Geo Richards talked about this or not. But what I have here is essentially a system where I, I potentially might react coal directly with a metal oxide. And the case I'm showing here is basically copper oxide. And so the, the goal will be then as I, I oxidize the coal to make carbon dioxide and, and water, there's no nitrogen here, so I don't have to worry about the separation unit at the end to, to sequester the CO2. And what comes out of this then is just my metal, or in this case, my copper. And I send it over to an oxidation reactor where I react the copper with air to make copper oxide. And then I transport the particles back over here. So I've got a way of actually doing oxy-fuel combustion without an air separation unit. And, and so one, one of the questions is asked, well, what is really the, the mechanism by which this reactor here is working? And early on, you know, it was thought maybe that somehow I'm creating uh, uh, carbon monoxide and, and, and the, uh, the carbon monoxide is acting with my is reacting with my metal oxide creating carbon dioxide and it's the carbon dioxide in here that reacts with the coal to create the carbon monoxide that reacts with the uh, metal oxide okay and, and obviously it, it, this could be done in syngas here and it, the same sort of thing can happen in, in, in coal oxidation where I'm also forming other uh, 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 volatiles such as hydrogen and, 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 and water vapor. There's been another uh, proposal that uh, basically I have a decoupled process where the metal oxide, like I showed you earlier, just decomposes, makes some sort of molecular oxygen. I have my, and it's the, the molecular oxygen then that reacts with the copper. Or can I have a direct solid state reaction at low temperatures where the metal oxide reacts directly with the carbon in a solid state? Okay. And then obviously if I get the, the metal over in this reactor, I can either react it with oxygen or if this is an energetic process, I can also make hydrogen out of my system. Okay, so we, we did some studies where we looked at nanomaterials uh, of uh, the ingredients here. We generated a, a simple experiment where we put a compacted material of, uh, of essentially graphite and, and copper oxide uh, in a small tube here. Uh, we ignited one end and we were interested in looking at propagation speeds, whether or not the material would propagate in a self-deflagration. Okay, we, at the beginning we were thinking that, you know, one again would have explosion limits or, or propagation flammability limits in these reactors if the particles got small enough. And we took high speed images and, and looked at the propagation rates. And we, we preheated the material and you can see this is the result of the propagation speed through here. And you can see that if the preheat is below a certain temperature, I get a certain propagation speed and as I heat it up, I get a, a jump and then a higher propagation speed. And it appears that at this lower propagation speed, what I'm getting is the direct solid state reaction between the metal oxide and carbon, uh, creating uh, carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide directly. And then as I increase the preheat temperature, I start to get that uncoupled reaction where now you're starting to see an influence of the, the metal oxide decomposing, making gaseous oxidizer, and that reaction's a little bit faster. In both cases, in, in micron, uh, if you were using micron material, what you would find is propagation speeds on this level. And you could not get the micron material to react unless you preheated it up to about 400. But in both cases, you saw the auto ignition temperature was still about 550K. So this would, uh, if you just heated the reactor up, it would self-ignite and propagate once it got up about 550. And what's interesting here is if you physically look at the, the modes of propagation, I'll show two pictures here. This mode over here, where we think that we have the direct solid state reaction, you see what looks like a fingering process, where you can actually see contact between particles, and that's what propagates the reaction. 
what you'll see in this case here, the, the propagation front is very uniform as though I'm making gas and it's propagating uniformly through the mixture. So again, if you, if you look at the, the low temperature preheat, you can see basically what looks like a fingering reaction and you're creating obviously gas and that is what's pushing the, the products away. You end up making basically copper and that's getting pushed away from the, but you can see it sort of fingering through the process. If I look at now a preheat temperature a little bit higher, you can see this wave front moves with a nearly uniform wave front indicating that the, the, the type of propagation has actually changed. Okay, so let, let me finish up. I, I think I have about 15 minutes. Let me show you some examples now how these materials are actually put, are starting to be applied. Okay, I mean, the, the existing, I, I put a, just a, a list here together. At the nano ingredients, early on, as I said, they were simply put in propellants and explosive in place of micron material. Uh, and uh, you, there, there's been the inner metallics and, and thermite systems have been used for in situ soldering and, and welding. Uh, you, you're finding them in uh, detonators. Obviously, one of the, the real big areas where nano energetics have been used early on is the igniters and in airbags, uh, gener gas generators themselves. You're finding in, in MEMS devices, you're, you're finding uh, nano energetics showing up as, as micro actuators, micro pumps of fluids. Uh, micro thrusters, micro switches actually turning, you know, having a solid state switch and throwing the switch by basically melting solder, micro valves, uh, dispersed catalysts uh, for drug injection, uh, creating visible light again for uh, maybe uh, calibrating spectrometers, uh, active denial. Uh, here, here's a case, suppose uh, you go back to Mission Impossible, many of you are probably too young, but in the early uh, TV shows, the the person would get basically a tape, and at the end of hearing the tape, it destroys, it's destroys itself, or potentially actually uh, preventing reverse engineering of chips, putting an energetic material within a chip itself and activating it so it basically destroys the chip upon an external command. I, I, I showed you a case of, you know, the chemical looping particles that are actually being designed that might go into use actually have to be designed. You know, I showed you an example just using pure copper oxide. But these particles are going to be much larger than nanoparticles. And during the design process, you'll probably have some substrate and then some, basically, some metal oxide embedded in that substrate. And you're going to want to basically minimize the diffusion length that's required. Because as I showed you, if you, if you have to transport all the way into the interior, then your, your reaction times are going to get much, much longer. And you also got to worry about mechanical properties of, of expansion as, and, 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 and contraction as you remove oxygen and add it to the system. So there's a lot of design of the uh, nano layers uh, on these particles themselves. So he here's an example where uh, just nano material was added to a typical propellant and put in a motor or in a strand and looking at burning rates. And what you can see here, this is a, was a typical uh, aluminized uh, propellant where one had micron aluminum. You change the pressure and what you find is with micron aluminum, you, uh, you get uh, regression rates of, of the propellant that increase with pressure. If I replace some of the, the micron aluminum with nano aluminum, I can accelerate the rate. And what's believed here is because the ignition temperature is much lower than the micron and it burns faster, what you find is the, the and movies confirm this, what you find is the nano material burns much closer to the surface. And so the heat feedback to the surface is better coupled with the surface reaction. Okay, and you get this increase in burning rate. People have also put it in explosives and there's been questioned whether or not can the, the nano sized material actually couple with a detonation front. Uh, and, and the results here are, are mixed. In some cases, people have actually shown some enhancement in the detonation propagation velocity and in other cases, it haven't. And the materials have been used widely already at the nano scale in the pyrotechnics community. Uh, another example, th this is actually some work that uh, I did with, uh, we did at Penn State with, with uh, Steve Sun at Purdue, and it was really a case where we wanted to see whether or not we could react. Uh, well, it started off with a, one of the uh, a question that NASA had. Uh, one of the early uh, missions in which people were looking at going back to, say, Mar uh, the moon and eventually going to Mars was to basically upload propellant and put it in low, low Earth orbit and store it there for a lengthy period of time, okay, because the biggest cost uh, of any 
lift vehicle is getting it out of the gravity well. Okay, so the idea was to put a lot of propellant, store it in low Earth orbit, and when one wanted to start the mission back to the moon or try to go to Mars, one would have all the propellant already out in a, in a, in a low gravity area. The problem with using uh, hydrogen is to store it cryogenically is very costly. Okay, leakage and the expense of keeping it cryogenic would be very expensive and, and impossible to store it for time periods of a year. <coughs> So we started to look at ways of which we could store hydrogen, but not cryogenically. And one of the ideas that we came up with is could we just freeze liquid water and aluminum particles and create a propellant that would create hot hydrogen when it reacted. <coughs> and so <coughs> what you see here then are some results, <coughs> excuse me, where we've actually mixed nanoaluminum in water <clears throat> and frozen in a, in a grain. <clears throat> so this is essentially an ice cube with aluminum mixed in it. If I were to do this with <coughs> micron aluminum and try to ignite it, it wouldn't propagate at all. You basically need the nanoscale features so that the reaction rates are fast enough. Here's a, 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 an example of looking at the burning rate of these pellets here. This is the burning rate as a function of pressure. And what you find here is these are some of the most energetic materials that the propellant community uses, HMX. Uh, <coughs> CL20 is probably the highest energy organic material today. And you can see the propagation speed of this mixture here actually exceeds these organic materials. So <coughs> extremely fast burning rates. Now. And, and you can see here, this is showing you the efficiency of the reaction. So we get nearly complete conversion of the water to producing hydrogen. Okay, so the question was, could we actually make this into a composite propellant to put in a sounding rocket and launch it? Okay, so we actually did motor tests where we created grains of this material with a center perforation, ignite it, and you can see one of the plumes here. Here's an example of the thrust that we were getting out of it. And a few years ago, we actually launched this in a, this sounding rocket. <coughs> out of Purdue, it's probably going to make some crazy noise. But you've got to watch it pass because the acceleration of this rocket off the launch pad is extremely fast. And the burn duration's only about a, it's only about a second. Now, if one looks at basically, you know, the performance of this particular mixture, it's not very good compared to typical propellants used to, for lift right now. If I compare this to, say, an ammonia perchlorate uh, uh, base propellant, the ISP, the, the specific impulse, is a little bit lower. So one would not want to use this for you know, heavy launch or anything like that on Earth. But if these materials are available uh, in situ, say on the moon, say water and aluminum, one could locally make the, these propellants for actually generating hydrogen or propulsion. Okay. <coughs> so it was a nice example of demonstrating the role of, of nanoenergetics, <coughs> where micron uh, ingredients would not work at all. Okay, th this is an example I, I mentioned about using graphene sheets as supports for catalysts. Uh, this is another case where we were looking at burning rates. We actually added uh, small quantities uh, of the graphene sheets to, in this particular case, nitromethane. Uh, the, and what you would find is, the, uh, depending on how the, the graphene sheets were functionalized, uh, they would be dispersible in a polar uh, liquid very readily and stay in suspension. Okay, and, and, and since the, the nitromethane is polar, what one would find is if you add just small quantities, uh, tens of ppm to hundreds of ppm, up to a uh, thousand ppm or so, you could stabilize and create stable colloids or soles of the mixture. And what I show here then is if you just fill a, a quartz tube with the material, you light it at one end, you can look at the rate at which it propagates with different levels of this graphene sheets added to it. And you can see here, this zero here is adding no material. And as I add the graphene sheets, I can increase the propagation rates by a factor of three or so. So I'm, I, I, again, I have control. <clears throat> and the other interesting thing was, if you change the, the functionalization of the graphene sheet itself. So in other words, if I reduce how much oxygen is on the surface, and by reducing how much oxygen, I'm essentially creating more defect sites. You can see I can also change the rate by how the graphene sheets are actually functionalized. We've also done this now with, with, with adding 
platinum to the surface, the, 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 and, and again, you can see enhanced effects. And these are some molecular dynamics calculations that, that uh, Roberto Carr and Annabella Saloni did here in the chemistry department, looking at how the nitromethane uh, is being affected by the uh, presence of the graphene sheets. And what you find is it's actually the functionalization at the defect sites that's responsible for the enhanced reaction of the nitromethane. And you, what you, you end up doing is you avoid the very slow gas phase reaction of breaking the CN bond. Uh, and you avoid that by actually getting uh, uh, CN uh, structures uh, coming off of the surface, like ammonia coming off of the surface right away. Uh, here's another example with graphene sheets, just to show you don't have to use an energetic materials. This is a case where the graphene sheets were added to methyl cyclohexane to see whether or not one could use it to aid the decomposition. Uh, as a, for example, in endothermic fuels for high-speed propulsion. And so this is a supercritical reactor where just small quantities of the graphene was, was added to uh, MCH, passed through the reactor, and look at its effect on it, whether or not it enhanced the decomposition. And here you can see a, a simple plot of, of time. So this is sort of residence time in the reactor. The blue symbols here are pure MCH. Uh, and you can see if I add 50 ppm, of uh, the FGS, I've essentially accelerated the decomposition. And you can see the acceleration uh, under these conditions here. Uh, you get an enhancement of 50 ppm of about 20% increase in the decomposition rate. And you can increase the amount of gas phase species, ethylene, methane, that's being produced. So again, you're seeing a, this surface heterogeneous effect. And it, this is, again, directly related to the defect sites. Uh, here, here's another example of dispersible catalysts. Uh, this is uh, some work of Dave Whitman in which uh, essentially nanoparticles uh, of bomite, this is essentially a droxylated aluminum oxide, uh, were again functionalized uh, w through uh, ligands, uh, through a carboxylic acid uh, bonding mechanism here at the surface. And depending on the ligand, how I change R, if R here is polar, then the material becomes dispersible in polar liquids. If it's nonpolar, then I can disperse it in hydrocarbons. And so here's some examples of different concentrations in, in hydrocarbons. And I show some results then of adding different levels of these bolomite particles. And the bolomite particles have also been altered by doing a metal exchange reaction. Bolomite by itself, the alumina, it acts as a substrate, but itself is also can be catalytic. Uh, but it, the, 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 you can enhance its, its catalysis capability by actually performing a metal exchange reaction and place, replacing some of the aluminum react elements with some other metals like palladium and platinum. And so he, here's an example uh, of one such case where the, the amount of material was added. This is a flow reactor looking at uh, passing in essentially a, a surrogate fuel with different concentrations of these particles and looking at how much CO2 reaction, or how much CO2 came out of the exhaust of the reactor. And you can see here uh, that at very low, without any material, sort of the hot ignition is out here. As I start to add small quantities of materials, I start moving the hot ignition to lower temperatures. Uh, you can see the, the low temperature chemistry being affected. And as I add more material, potentially I can lower the hot ignition to, to lower temperatures. Uh, here, here's an example of, of some of the nanofoil work that I was telling you about. This is actually the, the work that uh, Tim Wise at, at Hopkins was doing. Uh, a spin-off company came off, and you can actually buy these foils now. Uh, you, the, this is a situation for an aluminum nickel system, so if it's ignited this end, here's the, the laminate layers, and you have a reaction front that propagates down, a mixing layer where the, 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 the aluminum mixes with the nickel to form an alloy. I'll show a short movie here where you can actually see a, a, a soldering process of the material. What's being done here is uh, you'll see two uh, brass materials. Uh, there's been a small amount of, of, of solder put down. Here's the nanofoil that you can purchase. I put another small layer of, of, of solder over here. The materials will then be combined and pressurized together. And then a reaction will be ignited from the one side and it'll be propagated through uh, this very thin dimension here. And what you'll do then is you'll create a, a, a solder weld between the material. 
And, and this has been done on a much larger scale. In fact, you can imagine, as I was showing you, you could use that cool spray technique to essentially spray layers on very large surfaces and do the same sort of process here. And, and that's the will. Uh, here's another case where, again, the foils, the, the nanoscale foils have been, have been used to create very small thermal batteries. Uh, thermal battery basically in, includes a cathode, electrode, anode, and you might have multiple cells here. But the goal here is to create heat to, to melt the electrode so that one basically creates a, a conductive wave through here. And if you can do that, you can create basically uh, uh, an electrical current that becomes uh, conductive. And you can actually uh, create a, a thermal battery that lasts for uh, potentially up to a few hours or so. And they've done it with these nanofoils and they've gotten very effective results out of the, the system. Here's a case of looking at micro thrusters. This is work that really probably got some of the digital microthruster work started. It was a project between TRW, uh, Caltech, and the Aerospace Corporation. And basically using MEMS fabrication techniques, uh, it was based a three component device. One has here a silicon wafer on top in which uh, nozzles were electrochemically etched. The bottom side of this was, had a nitride, a silicon nitride surface to create basically a membrane. Uh, this is essentially a, a glass that was a piece that was photo etched to create the combustion chambers, uh, which would store a small amount of uh, lead stephanate as the as the energetic material. Then the the bottom material here is again a silicon wafer in which a, a, a polysilicon uh, resist was put down as an igniter. Uh, and what you would do then is you would basically heat the bottom a spot that would ignite the propellant, burst the diaphragm, and you get an impulse of thrust. Uh, the idea was to make this as a digital unit where I'd have just a, a matrix array of all these thrusters and I could fire any particular one I wanted that creates diff different vectors of thrust. So you can imagine I could cover an entire surface of a, a space vehicle with this to, to, and keep consuming these elements. Some of the problems early on with this initial design was the fact that I get crosstalk between the combustion chambers because of the, the small size here. I'd actually have a thermal wave transport and I could actually ignite neighbors. Uh, the other thing was, was a, a poor design was I was like, actually igniting the propellant from the bottom side here. So I'd start to pressurize the, the chamber before all the propellant was burnt and I'd actually throw propellant out the nozzle then. This is some work here that was, has modified this, again using some MEMS fabrication techniques. Uh, in this particular case, again, you'll, you'll see cavities here, but in this particular case, the igniter was put on the nozzle side here. And what you should notice, how the propellants were actually added here. Screen printing techniques as well as uh, ink jets have been used to spray the, the small quantities of propellants into these uh, devices. And again, this is a, a, a thrust profile of these small thrusters. You can see that there, there's an igniter in here that overdrives the propellant and then I get a pro progressive burn that creates a rather long period of thrust. So again, uh, there's been quite a success in, in making these digital thrusters. This is a particular case that Carol Rossi has done. And th this is a nice case because it demonstrates a number of uses of energetic materials on chips. Here's a particular case where I, I showed you how she was making these uh, aluminum copper oxide thermites. She put down an igniter first, a, a polysilicon resist igniter. She coat over top of the igniter here her copper. She'd grow her copper wires and then she uh, deposit her aluminum through the, the physical vapor deposition on the surface. She sends a small pulse of current here. She can ignite this so she can create a hot pan here. So she needs to create a hot source for, for doing something with it. She can. Uh, and this just shows uh, the ignition characteristics. And what she's done here, she's actually been making some MEMS safe arm fire devices. And what this does, is, I don't have the real picture here because I wanted to show schematic, but the device does three things. What she does here, she has a piston lever moves back and forth. So she has an energetic material here that she fires at the nanoscale that creates gas that actually throws this lever from this position over here by pressurizing it, moving it over. So she's now armed this device. She now has a, a, another energetic nanothermite material here that creates a lot of heat that basically sends down an ignition source to her device down here. And over here, it's not seen very well, but she actually has a switch that's driven off of an energetic material where she actually melts a solder ball that creates a hard line switch that closes once it melts. 
So again, the idea of actually incorporating these energetic materials to do these multifunction at the chip scan. Here's an example of actually making a, a jumping sensor with an energetic material. This is on a porous silicon wafer. So here, basically, a little grasshopper in uh, the bottom side for a propulsion mechanism. There's a small porous regime where I have nanoporous silicon. I fill it with an oxidizer. I have an igniter. And on the other side, I can put sensors. And so I could have this sitting out in a field or something. And if I wanted to jump above the surface to, to act as a sensor, I can actually fire it. And you can actually see it hop here above the surface and a sensor could be activated to actually to, to, do, it about, to do some sort of measurement. Uh, here's a situation where there's been work in actually looking for actuators or for pumping techniques where again, uh, energetic materials put locally in a MEMS device uh, where it actually creates gas. This, this component here decomposes to make uh, molecular nitrogen as, as the product gas mainly. And what that does then is it, it creates gas that then pumps a fluid the idea of pumping this fluid then can be used, for example, for drug injection. So here's, again, a, a small device that people have made uh, where there, there's an energetic material. There, there's a sort of an airbag type system here where I pressurize this. I have basically a drug that I need to inject very quickly through a small needle here. And so all I have to do is uh, fire a, a small switch that pressurizes it. This can all be encapsulated into a very small uh, MEMS type device. Uh, here's some examples how some uh, microenergetic valves, and these have actually been built uh, for some of the Area 5 launch vehicles. But the idea of actually creating what looks like an airbag, uh, if I do this, I could actually create airbags just like those dis digital thrusters on a surface. So I could actually morph a surface. Okay, I could fire these little digital devices, I could morph a surface. I could have a, a, a vehicle change directions depending on how I actually morph that surface because I can get a lot more force out of this gas than say out of a piezoelectric device. Okay, so one could actually morph surfaces very easy. Here's a, again a, another example of a drug injection device where I'm essentially pressurizing a membrane that pushes uh, the drug out of these uh, valves here that are actually, again, energetic valves that are actually opened uh, with an uh, energetic material. Okay, so just to give you a, a summary here, I tried to show you some examples and just to give you a summary where I think this field, particularly at the, you know, is, is moving. Obviously, what you're seeing in, in, in examples I'm starting to show you is the initial work is, since we're not, we're not at a stage where we can make a large quantity of these, of these organized structures yet, you're going to see it propagate into these very small devices. And, and so I, I think what we're starting to recognize is that we want to, the field is starting to look at how one can atomistically, uh, uh, basically control the growth from a, a bottom-up type approach with the goal of actually starting to develop smart materials in which I a priori design the system so that I want to create a, either a, a gas to pressurize the system, I want to create heat as a source of power to convert that power into electricity to activate a sensor. I want to create a particular type of chemical species so that maybe I can calibrate in situ a, a small a spectrometer. Okay, so I, and to do that, I need to, to generate a particular species. So what you're starting to see is a lot of multifunctional characteristics being developed in the nanoenergetics. Uh, these are the type of metrics that one could envision down the road uh, through the nanoenergetics. The idea of being able to produce heat from about 200 to 3,000 Kelvin, producing local pressure from kilopascals to, to gigapascals producing different types of gas, uh, looking at uh, different types of fabrication processes. I've tried to illustrate some of these examples in the latter slide, but I said inkjet printing is already done, screen printing has already been done, different types of lithography have done, self-assembly you've seen. And, and just to show why there's still interest again here, this shows some of the energetics, particularly looking at these nanothermite systems from an energy density point of view. There's a significant amount of energy then the idea of actually scaling up and using these sort of systems eventually in macroscopic devices. I list here some examples uh, of you know, some of the issues that people can look at scientifically still. Uh, there are a lot of scientific questions. A lot of these have to do with the fabrication and what type of energetic materials, how to build the structures themselves, and then the, the engineering aspects, how they react, how to control the reaction uh, in, in these issues here. So with that, I'll just summarize uh, 
in saying that it, it's a, a small field. Most of the field is still highly science. The applications are, are just being generated. Uh, but I think it's a very good example of, of where one can start looking at the, the connection between nanotechnology and, and combustion aspects in, in terms of seeing some uh, applications come about in a rather short period of time. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, finish and entertain any questions if there are any.